heard. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. You can't visit this stuff and expect to walk in the power of God. You have to live in it. Oh, Chris, that's not great. That is grace. Grace empowers you. We're going to talk about that today. I'm going to, I'm going to continue kind of a theme that I started last week, but we're going to probably go to some of the, even some of the same verses because, man, if you don't get these definitions and if you don't understand what grace is, what righteousness is, what faith is, and a lot of people don't understand the things of faith. They think, well, faith comes by having heard. The Bible does not say that. And it also says in that same context, that's Romans 10, 17, if you read about verses 14 on down, it says, how shall they hear without a preacher? I know people think, well, I just get everything directly from God. I don't have to listen to a preacher. That's called arrogance, self-righteousness, and pride. God has put some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body, till we all come together in the unity of the faith. Those are gifts. I need preachers. You need preachers. Now here, we don't live on preachers, and God does speak directly. I agree with that. You need to have your personal relationship with God. The sad thing is, like everything, people abuse it. And I don't read the Bible. That's what I pay my preacher to do. No, you need to have a relationship with God yourself. Amen? Amen. But God uses gifts to help you that point you to Jesus. You Amen? Amen? If a preacher is pointing you to himself or herself, then there's a problem. There Amen? Amen? But see, here's the point. The Lord, Lord told me this. He said, anything that fosters pride is not my voice. A lot of people, well, bless God, I don't need anybody to tell me. God tells me, well, aren't you something? Isn't it amazing that he, he put the whole body fitly joined together? Amen? Come on. I'll tell you, we need to understand what grace is. Amen. Amen. So faith does not come by having heard. It comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. Before we start, though, I want to, sh this is a little joke that Naomi Cantrell sent me that it's very funny because last week we was talking a lot about the heart. So I thought, man, this is a real fitting joke. I like this. It says, so there's a story of a little guy who was at school and they were going to, to, uh, to do the Pledge of Allegiance. The teacher said to put their hands on their hearts and Johnny put his hand on his bottom. The teacher thought he was being funny and laughed and, said, and then said again, put your hands on your hearts. Again, Johnny put his hand on his bottom. And if, uh, as a few more tries, the teacher finally said, Johnny, why do you keep putting your hand on your bottom? And Johnny said, because that's where my heart is. Who, what makes you think that, asked the teacher. Because whenever I go to Grandma's, she gives me a big hug, pats me there, and says, bless your little heart. <laughs> so, that's funny, but you know, think about it. That's how we get some of our definitions, is it not? You know, last week we talked even about grace. And we talked about what is grace? What is faith? What are these things? Can I say a few things about faith before we move on? Is that okay? Okay. Faith appropriates what grace has supplied. Jesus, by His grace, has made everything available to you and I. Okay? It's appropriated or received through, through faith. Faith in what He did. See, a lot of people think that, well, they're under grace, and because they're under grace that it just means sloppy living. And that's not the case. Let me, I'm going to read this to you. Uh, this is from a guy by the name of James Richards. Grace is not God's ability to overlook sin, but it, it is His ability to overcome sin. Grace is not God's ability to overlook sin. It's His ability to overcome sin. And faith appropriates what grace got Jesus through His grace has made available to you and I. Faith appropriates it. Faith sees Everybody say, faith sees. Faith sees. Let me, faith sees what grace has supplied. Did you know that? Faith sees what grace has supplied. Let, in fact, let me, let me show you. Well, I'll tell you what. Let me start with Romans chapter 3, verse 27. We'll talk about faith. This is going to be my first definition. We're going to talk about faith. I'm going to show you how faith sees and then how faith appropriates what God has already supplied through His grace. Amen. And faith is realized through righteousness. What is righteousness? We've talked about these terms, but I'm going to try to, I'm trying to bring them all together. Because I've entitled this message, How Grace Works. <laughs> uppercase, the works. W-O-R-K-S, all uppercase. All capital letters. Because grace works. People say, bless God, I'm under grace. I don't do nothing. You're not under grace. 
In fact, before we go there, I'm coming back to that one. Jump over to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. They all go together. All this goes together. I just want to show you this. But as ye abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. You know what he's talking about. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, he's talking about giving. They were taking up an offering for the poor saints at Jerusalem that were going through a lot of stuff. And he calls it a grace. That's my point. He calls it a grace. He calls giving a grace. What is a grace? It's an empowerment. Last week I told you Thayer's definition of grace. It's, it is unmerited favor, but it's a lot broader. Grace is God's divine influence upon the soul that does two things. Everybody say two things. It strengthens and it empowers. That's why Romans 6, 14 says, Sin shall not have dominion over you, believer, for you are not under the law, but you are under grace. So if sin's dominating me and I'm living a sloppy life, I'm not under grace. I'm under a law. It's probably my own law. I've turned the grace of God into lasciviousness is what Jude verse 3 and 4 talks about. Verse 4 in particular, but that whole context. That's what it is. See, because grace is not that. Grace is empowering. And grace is... A, here's what I want you to see. See that you abound in this grace also. He's talking about it, about giving as being a grace. Now, boy, that's a new wrinkle in your brain, isn't it? Isn't that something? Because people have this idea that grace is just... Wow, I was under law, now I'm under grace. We don't do anything to be right with God other than say yes to Jesus. Jesus did everything to make us right with God and he put us in him. Amen? Amen. So once we realize that, then we, we can receive his grace through faith. Now go to Romans chapter 3, verse 27, please. Romans 3, verse 27, look at this. Where is boasting then? That's amazing. Where is boasting then? You know religion always likes to brag? Religion always brags. I'll tell you what, I'm better than you. I'm better than that old publican down the road. I'm better, you know, I don't smoke or dip or chew or go with those who do. I'm, I'm a good person. But works will, religion will always brag. Remember the man in Luke chapter 18, the, the publican and the Pharisee, one, they went down to pray and one said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Then he relisted his, his religious credentials and he said, man, I do all these things. I'm not even like this old publican here. And the Bible is so, so amazing. It's in Luke 18, verse 9 on down. But, but it's so amazing. The Bible said he prayed with himself. <laughs> that always cracks me up because I don't even believe the demons could handle that prayer. <laughs> We're out of here, man. <laughs> this guy stinks, you know. And the Bible says he prayed with himself. But the other one who humbled himself and said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. That guy went down to his house justified. And of course, we know that was before the cross. So if you're born again, you're not a sinner. I say that. You're born again. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. We'll get to that here in a little bit. But it's so vital that we understand these things. Where is boasting then? Then it answers the question. It is excluded. People that brag about what they've done and who they are and all those types of things are self-righteous people. Everything we have is a gift. You, I can't brag that I earned a gift. I can't brag. You know, I, I used this example one time. I was thinking about uh, the gift of, of ministry and all that type of stuff and, and pulpit ministry. And I think, Lord, thank you that, you know, you've put a gift in my life. And just thinking, that's being honest. You need to be honest. And I said, but I, have, I, I remember thinking, I was in Pickle, Ohio, remember it. It's been a couple years ago. And I said, but you know, I've developed it. And the Lord said, even your ability to develop it is a gift. Amen. There is, where is boasting? Excluded, non-existent. That according as it is written, he that glories boast or brag, we only brag on Jesus. Amen? Amen? It is excluded by what law? Of works? No or nay, but by the law of faith. Now here's what I'm after. The law of faith? Oh, that's cussing, Chris. The law of faith? The law of faith? Now, that's not talking about a law of earning anything. That's saying that faith works by certain principles. Amen? I used the example last week. I said, if you say, hey, man, you know, I want to wire my house with wood. You can do that, but it's probably not going to conduct electricity very well. Even though it's cheaper, maybe, or you like it better, if you don't cooperate with the laws of electricity, it's not 
going to work. Amen. There's a law outside called gravity. You're enjoying gravity right now. Gravity's keeping you on that seat, correct? But you know if you abuse the law of gravity, it'll kill you. If you jump off a, a tall building, there's that same law that's keeping you in your seat will end up taking your life. Amen? There are laws. There is a law of faith. Amen? Faith only appropriates what grace has supplied. Faith only uh, receives what grace has made available. We need to understand this. That's amazing to me that there's a law of faith. Now go to uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, therefore, having been justified by faith. Now, let, let's, let's, let me say this about faith. Faith has an object. Yes. Faith has an object. Amen. What religion does is, make, is, is make the object of your faith you. You, you hear me? Right. Religion makes it about you. And I've said this before. God took you out of the equation because the chain's only as strong as its weakest link and you're not a link in the chain. Okay? All right. All right. So faith makes the, uh, uh, religion makes the object of your faith you. I've used this example several times. Y you remember those, those, these old films of when man was first learning how to fly? And you see all those contraptions? You know, like, like you know, you hear the, the projector running. It's like, you know, these things going like this and these, you know, like 20 wings or whatever. And then it c collapses. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, if you say, man, I have great faith. But the object of my faith is one of those contraptions. And we're going to fly off this cliff. You may have great faith, but it's in the wrong object. <laughs> Amen? But if you say, man, I don't know. I don't know about flying on a, on a modern jet. I don't know about that, but all right, I will. Even though your faith is little and you're apprehensive and you're concerned, if the object of your faith is a good modern jet, you get on that thing, you may be nervous, but you may be up in the air and down at your destination in a short time. See, it's not so much about your faith as it is the object of your faith. That's why the Bible says in Romans 11, or Hebrews eleven six 6, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. In other words, without your faith being in the correct object, which is Jesus Christ and His redemptive work, it's impossible for you in your own strength to ever please God. But when you realize what Jesus has done, guess what? You're pleasing to God. God looks at you. The Bible says you're accepted in the beloved. I'm going to say something about that, accepted in the beloved. You know, uh, that word is in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6. Can I show you something where that word is found? One other place in the New Testament where it talks about accepted in the beloved. And, and, and it's translated in this verse, highly favored. Luke chapter 1, verse 28. Watch this. Luke chapter 1. And we'll come back to uh, Romans 1. And have come... Uh, this, and having come in, the angel said to her, now this is amazing. This is when Gabriel, the angel, appears to Mary, announcing that she would be pregnant with Christ. The birth of Christ. Now look at this. And, and, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Now keep that up there. Go to the next verse. And I wanna, I'm going to say something about that one. And when she saw him, she was troubled at the, his saying, and considered what manner of greeting or salutation this was. Now watch this. It, imagine if the angel would have came in and said, you old sorry thing. You old sorry thing, I'll tell you what. Um, I, I ought to, <laughs> you sorry, th I mean, you're, you're just, you, you're a wretch, you're a miserable. Mary would have probably said, well, this must be God. How many times do we think that's how God talks to us? We think that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit's the one that's saying, you sorry thing. The, the, the Holy Spirit's the one that's saying, every time you mess up, man, I'll tell you what, uh, one more time, I've about had it with you. Uh, you sorry thing. That's not the Holy Spirit. And Mary at least had an excuse because she had been under law for some 1,500 years. Amen? But you and I, this is why we need a righteous mentality. A righteous mentality. Now go back to Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Talking about faith, talking about grace, going to talk about righteousness, and going to talk about your heart. Therefore, having been justified by faith, faith in what Christ has done, we're going to get peace. We're going to get peace someday. In the sweet by and by. We have peace. We have peace. We have peace right now. Right now, we have peace. That's why the angels proclaimed when they announced the birth to the, to the shepherds, they said, peace on earth, 
Goodwill to men. They proclaim peace on earth, but we look around, we don't see peace on earth. He's not talking about peace between men and men. He's talking about now there would be peace between God and man because Jesus was here. And see, and so many people feel like God, their heart's condemning them. We talked about that last week. They're, they're, they're doing this to say, well, how can you expect to receive from God after the way you've been, after the way you talked to your wife this morning, after what you've done? Their heart's condemning them because they're not a settled and established in the peace that Jesus has purchased. Therefore, being justified by faith in what Christ has done, we have peace with God through our effort. Through our, through our good deeds. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But see, in order, in, in order to experience the peace of God, we've got to understand we've got peace with God. That we don't have to be sin conscious, we need to be Christ conscious. I was going to call this message from, from sin consciousness to sun confidence. <laughs> That's a good title. We need to be confident. But see, you can't be confident unless your heart is established in what he's done. And that takes great effort. I know people don't like that. Oh, that's not grace. That is grace. Voices right now are screaming at you. If you're not in the word, if you're not sowing the word in your heart, you're never going to get a harvest. I heard a story about a farmer. And he, man, he got really turned on to the Lord. And he said he, did, he decided, I'm not going to plant my wheat crop because God will take care of me. And he did not cooperate with the laws of nature. Guess what? About a month before uh, the wheat harvest, everybody else's wheat was coming up. He went out and planted his crop, but it was too late. I forget how many thousand dollars he lost. And he said, why did God do this? God didn't do this. If you don't cooperate with the law of faith, it don't work. Amen. If you don't plant the word of God in your heart, you don't get a harvest. And God loves you. And if you're born again, you're going to heaven. But you have got to cooperate, which was another title I thought about using. You've got to cooperate with the law of faith. Amen. You've got to cooperate with the law of faith out of Romans 3.27. You've got to cooperate. That means your part in receiving it. But so many people, I'm going to pick on one right now. Your words. People think, oh, yeah, we just call things that are not as though they are. No, when you change your belief system and you're receiving belief, and you begin to realize how important your words are. Your words direct your faith. Amen. Amen. You know, if more Christians would stand there, they're praying to God to stop the tornadoes instead of standing up and speaking to the tornado and commanding it to go. You have that kind of authority. Most of us don't believe that because our heart condemns us. Amen. How, how, how do you change that? You get into it and you live in it. You begin to assure your heart that what God says is true. You, you realize I've been justified by faith and all of a sudden you experience this peace with God that you already have and as you, you, it assures your heart that you have peace with God because of what Jesus has done and not what you're doing or not doing. See, that's the danger of sin. When people live in sin, it hardens their heart. Amen. The more, you, the more you feed that, what, whatever you feed is what's going to come up in your life. If you don't put the word of God in your life, God loves you, but you're not getting a harvest. The Bible's, let, let me show it to you. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. This is so good. 1 Peter chapter 1. Having been born again. Woo! Having been born again. Having been born again. In the Greek, it's in the perfect tense which means it's a present state as a result of a past action with continuous results. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed. The word seed is where we get the word sperm. Sperma. Amen. <laughs> Whoa. Now watch this. But incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. In everything, it's the word. It, the, once the word takes root, the Bible says in James chapter 1, we receive the engrafted or the implanted word, which is able to save our souls. What is our souls? Our mind, our will, and our emotions. It's able to assure our heart and save our souls. Oh my, that's good. Oh my, that's good. Are you hearing? Man, that's good stuff. So faith appropriates what grace has already supplied. And as I said earlier, faith sees. What does faith see? Faith sees what Jesus Christ has already provided by grace. Faith sees. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 18. 
chapter 4, verse 18. Look at this. Look at this. Therefore, since we... Uh, what did I say? Where did I say? That's good, though, too. While we look not at the things which are seen. While we look not at the things which are seen. How do you... Does that mean you go through life like this? Whoa. And you better watch where you're going. And if you're driving, I'm not riding with you without your eyes open. Okay? I love you. Sorry, but I ain't doing it. Because that's foolishness. That's not what he's saying. He's saying our focus is not upon what we see. But our focus is upon the things which are not seen. The spiritual things. I'm going to show you an example from the Old Testament here. Watch this. For the things which are seen are temporary, which means they're subject to change. We don't deny facts, but we exalt truth or reality, which trumps the facts. When a plane takes off, it doesn't deny the law of gravity. It's just acknowledging a higher law of thrust and lift or aerodynamics or whatever it is that supersedes the law of gravity. And that's the way it is with the things of God. We don't deny things. We don't deny what's going on. But we acknowledge that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We don't deny that we're sick. But we acknowledge there's a higher law that says by his stripes I'm healed. And if I believe that, I receive that, and I talk that, and that's the way it is. I am so proud of my wife. I am so proud of her because this woman is refusing to take no. And this is another thing I want to say about faith. I'm going to stay on faith. Cease. But faith is aggressive. <clears throat> faith is aggressive real aggressive I'll say it again faith is aggressive real aggressive faith does not take no for an answer so if you're cooperating with the law of faith it's aggressive passive people have a problem receiving from God oh it just will happen I just naturally believe God nobody naturally believes God we're all led by our senses until we allow the Holy Spirit to overcome that. That's the, see, this is what grace, this is what faith does. Faith is aggressive. If God said it, I'm not settling for less. Well, it just might happen. That's why I say we got to be tougher than we are. Oh, you know, just, you know, let little Johnny do what he wants. No! Tell little Johnny who's in charge. Well, I let my body do what it wants. No! You tell your body who's in charge. Joel was so funny. He was talking to my mom the other day, and he started talking about, yeah, you can speak to your body. I thought, I thought, Joel, she's not understanding this. He was going, <laughs> but it was funny. It was awesome. It was awesome. Praise God. Mom was like, well, that, <laughs> I'm so funny. <laughs> he was adamant, man. You can tell your body, you can tell your body what's going on. You can tell in the name of Jesus. But see, that's not going to happen until you start assuring your heart. Faith is aggressive. Faith is not passive. Passive people really struggle receiving what Jesus has provided. There's a violence that takes what God has already provided by grace. You know why? Because all these voices out there are telling you, not so. Not so. And many of them are in the church. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, I knew someone that had that too and they died. Death and life are in the power not only of what you say, but of what you hear. Now back to faith sees. So the things which are seen are temporary, which means they're subject to change. But the things which are not seen, the things of God, they're of eternal value. Let me give you an Old Testament example of how faith sees. Go to 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8. I think that's where it's at. 2 Kings. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. Next verse. <coughs> and the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are come down there, the man of God being Elisha. And the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Next verse. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Next verse. And one of the servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. <laughs> you know, you have the Holy Spirit to tell you things to come and bring to remembrance everything Jesus has said to you. Yes, Hallelujah. So he said, go and see where he is that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, surely he is in Dotham. Next verse. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. 
And when the servants of the man of God, when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, in other words, whoa, dude, <laughs> my master, what shall we do? Now stop. He's freaking out. He's looking at a natural circumstance. He's freaking out. You ever been there? We've all been there. You're looking at a natural circumstance and you're freaking out. That's what this guy's doing. Totally natural. Even like when, when Moses sent the 12 spies in, you know, the, into the land and said, spy out the land in Numbers chapter 13. And, and 10 came back, the Bible says, with an evil report. And two, Joshua and Caleb came back with, with God's report. The 10 that came back with an evil report, the report was everything was factual. Everything they said was factual. The land's good, the land's great, uh, but there's giants in the land. And, we, and then we, we, the, the report they saw did not deny the facts, the evil report. But it exalted the facts above the word of God. And God calls that an evil report. Now watch this. So this guy's freaking out. He says, what shall we do? How many of you have been there? What shall we do? Look at the next verse. So he answered. Elisha answers his servant and says, do not fear. Look at your neighbor and say, do not fear. Do not fear. You've heard the acronym for fear. False evidence appearing real. All right. Do not, God hasn't given you the spirit of fear. But the spirit of fear is prevalent in the world. My wife and I talk, sometimes people will say something to you and it just it shoots a, like a dart of fear in you. You know what I'm talking about? You got to watch that stuff. You can't totally avoid it because you're in this world. But if you don't feed on the word of God, you'll never get a harvest. If you don't put the word of God, the incorruptible seed in your heart, your heart will never be assured. You know why I beg you to come to that healing thing on Thursday? Is it because we need more people here? We don't. We don't care. It's because it will help you. It will change your life. It's changing the life. Listen to Charlie's testimony. It's only the beginning. It's going to get greater. We need the word of God constantly. Constantly. That's why I'm so proud of my wife. I mean, she is just sucking the life right out of those Cecil packs and CDs. Right into her and then she gives it to me and I'm doing it with someone else. These are men of God and it's, it's not great teaching. But it's the spirit of faith that I pull on. Are you hearing the difference? Great teaching's awesome. I believe in that. But there's a spirit behind what people say. Some people really believe it. And to some people, it's more just information. Oh, somebody hear that. We have this. I love that spirit of faith. So he answered, do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Woo! You know, that's what God's saying to you and I. Those that are with you are more than anything out there. Man, that's good. Now, I'm going to show it to you in the New Testament, but let's read a couple more verses. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Now, wait a minute. The guy could see because he saw the Syrian armies all around him. But you know, there's a seeing and then there's a seeing. There's a seeing with the natural eye and then there's a seeing with the eye of faith. Faith sees what God has made available. Amen. But see, you're not going to develop faith by listening to as the stomach turns or, or whatever all day. Faith is not going, you're not going to, it's not going to happen. You got to feed on the word of God. You got to put it in you. This is grace. Because then see, faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. And all of a sudden you start, wow, I believe this. It ain't no big deal. None of this is a big deal with Jesus. It's only a big deal because in our own eyes, we're grasshoppers. All right. That's what they said in Numbers 13. Why? Because they were looking at the circumstance more than they were looking at the promise of God. Right. Joshua and Caleb said, yeah, that's all true, but we're well able because we got a word from the Lord. And I'm telling you, you've got a word from the Lord. By his stripes, you are healed. Not going to be healed, you are right now. You were healed, 1 Peter 2.24. That's it. That's it. You are blessed. You can speak to things. You can take your wallet out right now and say, I know it's foolishness to the world, but it's not to God. And say, you be full in the name of Jesus. Amen. Give me your purse, Jen. I'll fill it up. Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke. And all the husbands said, no. Go. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Glory to God. One more, just one more, and then I'm going to show you. I think. 
So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and, and said, strike this people, I pray thee with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of the Lord. Go back to verse 17. I just want you to see this quickly. Once again. So Elisha prayed, open his eyes that he may see. Now, does that have a New Testament counterpart? Yes, it does. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Look at this. Ephesians chapter number 1. And start with about verse... We'll start with verse 15. Ephesians 1 verse... We'll just start with 15. Therefore also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I said, man, these guys are doing good. I don't, I'm going to stop mentioning them in prayer. That's what we do. Isn't it a lot of times? Whew, Emerson's doing great. I'm going to quit mentioning him. See, prayer doesn't have to be a big thing where like you're praying for three hours for everyone on your prayer list. That does, just make mention of them. That's the kind of authority you have. Amen? Just mention Pastor Chris and Jen and your prayers and their family. Just say in the name of Jesus, I thank you that they're blessed. Whatever. Just mention this. That's the kind of authority you have. When I, when I receive communion in the morning, I say, I, I decree that my family's blessed, I'm blessed, and this church is blessed. That's everyone here, no matter how often or little you attend, you're blessed. God's hands on you. Amen. How do you know? I decree it. That's the kind of authority you have. Now watch this. Therefore also after we heard, we heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Next verse. Do not cease to th give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Next verse. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you more, more of his ability, more, no, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. This is what the body needs, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. But if I don't cooperate with the law of faith and put the word of God in and meditate upon the word of God, guess what? It's going to be pretty tough for God to revelate something that I don't have in me. Amen. See, this is grace. Grace is God's divine influence upon the soul. It enables and it, and it strengthens. It's unmerited favor, but it's un I like to call it unmerited ability. Go to the next verse, please. The eyes of your understanding. That word understanding is the Greek word for heart. The eyes of your heart or your understanding being enlightened. The Amplified Bible says the eyes of your heart being flooded with light. Flooded with light. You ever notice God's not a little dab, little dab will do you type of a, of a God. He's not one of those. God's floods you. And even when it says we receive, it doesn't say we receive grace. We receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. That's what causes us to reign. What does it mean to reign? When other people are sick, you're healthy. When other people are succumbing to sin and depression, you're not. When other people are walking in turmoil, you're not. And it's not contingent upon what you're going through. The, oh, I, I want to go to this church in Revelation, Church of Smyrna, but we, maybe we will. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened or flooded with light that you may know, that you may know, that you may know, that you may know, not guess, that you may know. Too many people are, well, I call it Christian theory. Well, I think I heard someone say that. Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> Is what the adversary says. That you got to know this, man. And that takes effort. I could have called this message the effort of grace. <laughs> Not effort to earn it. God's already earned it. But effort to believe what God's already earned and to assure your heart so your heart's not condemning you when God is not. Amen. Man, that's good news. That's such good news I can't hardly stand it. The eyes of your understanding and heart being flooded with light that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in heaven. God, I read it wrong again. In the saints. In the saints. In the saints. See, we think of glory. Well, someday when we exit this body and we're, we're, in, we're in heaven and all of a sudden it'll just be so bright we can't hardly stand it and all that. He's talking about the glory that's in you right now. The inheritance has been deposited in you. We have this treasure in earth and vessel, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, that the excellency of the glory may be of God and not of Christ. Do you know why sometimes when you preach and some people are like, man, that's good. And other people, they hear Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. Wah, 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 wah. And wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah. 
wah, wah. And they think, that's all I hear is wah, wah. It's because their heart's hardened. They got a heart. I'm just telling you, in love, your heart's hardened. What you're treasuring is what your heart's on. Whatever I treasure is where my heart goes. If I treasure him, guess where my heart goes? If I treasure sewing, that's where my heart goes. I don't know, baseball. There's nothing wrong with those things, but don't let your treasure go somewhere other than him. That's what the Bible calls an idol. The eyes of your understanding being flooded with light that you may know what is the hope. The word hope means confident, joyful, expectation of good. It's not like, well, I'm hoping. That's why it says in Romans chapter 4, verse 18, about Abraham, who against hope, believed in hope. Who against natural hope, believed in God's hope. He still had a confident, joyful expectation of good because he knew God. Watch this. The eyes of your understanding being flooded with light, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory. The riches. The riches. You know you're rich. You know you're rich. How many amens did I hear? Lord, take notes. <laughs> You're rich? Rich says, I know I am. <laughs> what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That's where it's at. It's not in heaven somewhere. It's in you. Heaven's in you if you're born again. Next verse. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? You notice that? It's us who believe. It's us who believe what? Believe what? What he's saying. That's why he, Paul does not tell you, pray that, that God will give you more. He says, pray that the eyes of their understanding, their heart would be flooded with light so they could see what they've already got in Christ. But it doesn't happen unless you plant the word in your heart. God can't revelate something to you that's not in you. It can't be somebody else's revelation. It's got to be yours. Watch this. Toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. Next verse. The same power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is in you if you're born again. That's pretty good. Now we all mental assent to that. But when it comes down to reality, see, once again, I keep saying to you, faith does not come by having heard. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing because if you're not hearing faith you're hearing other voices voices of unbelief voices that are telling you you're going to die voices that are telling you this and listen what you put in your heart what you sow today is what you'll reap tomorrow the Lord showed me this he said we are building our belief system every single day yes. did you know that and so many people wait oh there's a tornado coming maybe we ought to build a tornado shelter too late <laughs> <laughs> run to the neighbors if you got them because you don't have time. The key is to build your faith when everything's going good. In times of peace, not in times of war. Watch the same power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. He seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Next verse. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but in that which is to come. In other words, that he's far above all that. And you're in him, so that means your position is far above all that. I'm going to give you an example here. Uh, two more verses. And hath put all things under his feet. All things are under his feet. All things are under his feet. Now my next question is, where are the feet? On the head, which is Christ, or on the body, which is the church? Are you hearing me? The feet are on the body. Amen? But we have to get aggressive with this. Once again, faith is not passive. Faith is aggressive. you got to get mad at the bad. Amen? When the scripture says, Be angry and sin not, neither let the sun go down on your wrath. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. The next verse says, Neither give place to the devil. When you stop being, when you're, when you're passive, you're giving place to the devil. Amen. He's defeated, but don't be passive. You're in charge in the name of Jesus. He gave you the name that is above every name. Use it. Amen. You, Bible says, you submit yourself to God. James 4, 7. You resist the devil and he'll flee from you. All people say, oh, I'm just praying that God would just, just do this and do that. God's already done everything he's going to do yes. in this age. Amen. God's done everything and it's up to you and I to enforce it. Amen. Amen. And I put all things under his feet and give the head of all things to uh, to be ahead over all things to the church. Next verse. 
which is his body. The church is his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. Now go to Ephesians chapter number 2. And I, or not Ephesians, I'm sorry. Revelation chapter 2. The church of Smyrna. Everybody say the church of Smyrna. Church of Smyrna. This was a heavily, verse, we'll start with verse 8 of Revelation chapter 2. This was a heavily persecuted church. The, the Bishop Polycarp was burned at the stake in Smyrna. History tells us. This was, this was not a good situation. But I want you to see what God sees. And this is what he tells this church, Smyrna, who he doesn't rebuke. This church, Smyrna and Philadelphia, the only two of the seven that, that he doesn't have somewhat against. Amen? And notice what he says. And to the angel, that's the, the angelos is the Greek word, the messenger, the presiding elder, probably the pastor, most theologians believe that, of the church of Smyrna, right? These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. Next verse. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty. Now this is amazing. They were under extreme persecution, extreme poverty. It was not a good situation. But notice what God says. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. But you are rich. You know, there's a lot of people, when it comes to material stuff, they have a lot of things, but they're extremely poor people. Did you ever wonder why some of the politicians and actors, movie stars and stuff, I mean, how much is enough? The Bible says in Proverbs, the eyes of man are never satisfied. I mean, how many houses can you live in? How many cars can you drive? How, many, how much is enough? Where does it end? Answer, it doesn't because the eyes of man are never satisfied. You can't satisfy an inward void with outward things. It'll never work. You know what I've discovered in life? The more I know Jesus, the less I want. Perhaps true prosperity, materialistically speaking, is not having more, but being more content with less. I'm not against things, but some people, where does it end? Where does the fun end? Where does he begin? It's all in him. But see, if you don't see from the spirit, no matter what you have, it'll never be enough. It'll never be enough. But if you're operating from the Spirit first, guess what? Everything's enough. Why do people with gorgeous husbands and wives, why do they go out and commit adultery? Why? Because they think, well, I'm just not satisfied. If I just get with this person, if I just get with that person, if I just do this, if I just do that. Holly Weird can't even keep their marriages together. I mean, think about it. They got everything, but they've got nothing. That's called poverty. I know you're, but here's what the Lord's saying. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. We could camp there, but I'm not going to. Next verse. Do not fear. Do not fear. Do not fear. That's what he's saying to you and I. Do not fear. You ever notice how many things there are in the world to fear? There are so many things to fear. I heard a story of a man who said, uh, he said he hired... He said, man, I'm tired of worrying about things. I'm just going to hire somebody to do all my worrying. So he hires the guy and he sat down and said, I'm going to hire you to do all my worrying. And he says, well, how much am I going to get paid? And he said, that's your first worry. <laughs> <laughs> do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. In, indeed, the devil's about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. You know, some of us, if every time, well, I'll tell you what, I'm offended. I went to that church and that pastor, he looked at me cross-eyed. Maybe he had gas. I'm sorry. <laughs> Not a good example. You know? <laughs> you know, but this is how people... But what if we're thrown in prison? What if, what, if, what if all of a sudden our feathers aren't stroked? What if all that's... Then what? See, this is why when you're grounded in him, you realize man may let you down, but God will never let you down. But once again, this doesn't happen until we begin to assure our hearts of what Jesus has done. And watch this. About to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. You have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Next verse. This is so powerful. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes, leave this up here please. He who overcomes, now this overcomes of all seven churches is in the present tense. Overcoming in God's eyes is a continuous action. Amen? We've overcome positionally but it's a continuous action. What overcomes? This is the victory, 1 John 5, 4, that overcomes the world and everything the world throws at you, even our faith. We're back to faith again, aren't we? Faith in what Christ has done. The victory that overcomes is knowing that God will never leave me hang. 
It's knowing that He loves me. He's, it's knowing that He's made me the apple of His eye because I'm in Christ. It's knowing that no matter what happens, I'm walking in victory. Amen? Amen? That's why He says, He that's overcoming shall not be heard of the second death. I've talked about the second death. And the second death, I know Revelation chapter 20 verse 14 says, Death and hell shall be cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. But it also talks in Revelation 21 verse 8 about people who take part in the, in the second death. They don't, it's not the whole second death. Many born again Christians participate in the second death, which is separation from God. That's not your lot. That's why it says in Revelation chapter 20 verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. What does that mean? It, when situations look contrary to the goodness of God and that you feel like you're separated from God, know that you're not because you're not partaking of the second death because he'll never leave you nor forsake you. I said a lot there. You're going to have to get a CD. Then what is the first resurrection? It's where your spirits had been raised up and seated together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's the first resurrection. When you realize where you are in the spirit, the second death has no power over you. You don't partake any part in it. The first one, it says, but the fearful. Those are people that are taking part in the second death. Whoremongers, adulterers, what? They're operating separate from God. And it says in Ephesians chapter 4 that even believers can walk as the Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. And the Bible says they're past feeling and they give themselves over unto lasciviousness, unbridled lust, because they don't know what Christ has done. And, if, and I'm telling you, he's talking to believers there, and he said, don't you walk by the, like those who are not believers. He who has an ear, let him hear. He who's overcoming shall not be hurt by the second death. The ultimate second death takes place when people die, according to Revelation 20, verse 14. When death is hell is cast into the lake of fire. But you're not to take any part in that. Miros is the Greek word. Don't participate in any form of separation from God because you're a partaker of the first resurrection where your spirit's been raised up and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. My word, that's good stuff. I said so much there, you'll have to get a CD. We got the price at free. We're not paying you to take them. If you don't want them, don't get one. But I'm telling you, you got to meditate on that. You got to compare scripture with scripture and you will see that this applies to me right now. Amen. Whew. I wanted to do one more. <laughs> one more quickie. Is that okay? I, I, I crave this stuff. I crave it. It's life. You know, all the, I want to do all seven churches. There's a promise to everyone that overcomes. That's overcoming. It's all present tense. I looked at every one of them. Go back to the uh, same chapter, back up to about verse 5. We'll start verse 5. I'll just show you another one. I love these promises to the one who overcomes. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. You thought I wouldn't say anything about the prayer language today, didn't you? Wrong. <laughs> Remember, therefore, from whence you have fallen, and I believe that's talking about in Adam, where every man has fallen. Not your whatever you did last night, not that. Repent and do the first works. Change your mind, do the first works or else I will come into thee quickly. Remove that candlestick, which is the church, from its place. It doesn't say they'll die and go to hell. It says, I'll remove you from your position of authority. That's what he's saying. The candlestick, according to chapter 1, verse 20, is the seven churches or the lamp, uh, uh, candlestick or lampstand in the New King James. Unless you repent or change your mind. Next verse. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Well, we could camp on the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans, I've told you before, it's two Greek words, Nikaia, which means to conquer, and Laos, the laity or the people. Those are what the Greek words say. But you know one of the tenets of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which God said he hates? Yes. They said that grace, since you're under grace, it doesn't matter how you live. That is a tenet of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And another thing they said, well, since you're under grace, you know, the only way to really know sin is to go do it so you understand what people are going through. God says, I hate that doctrine. I hate it. I hate That's strong. I hate it. That was part of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Next verse. He who has an ear, let him hear. There it is again. He who has an ear, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made even both of them. Proverbs 20, verse 12. Talking about your spiritual ear. I'm sure every one of those people there probably had appendages on the side of their head called ears, right? But he's saying if you have an ear, an ear of the Spirit, watch this. Let him hear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
To him who overcomes, there's overcoming. I love this. I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. I will give to eat to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes, to him that over, overcomes. That faith is aggressive. He understands that faith sees to him that overcomes. You're going to let you partake of the tree of life. Well, praise God, that'll happen when we die. Well, it's, it's, it can happen right now. I could give you a whole bunch of the things on what is the tree of life. Go to Proverbs 15.4. I'll show you one definition of the tree of life. Are you ready? He who overcomes. He's overcoming because his faith is in what Jesus did and not what in he's doing, not what he's doing. His faith is in the finished work of Christ and Jesus, all that Jesus accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection. So he's overcoming. He's abiding in Jesus, not abiding in himself. He's overcoming and he understands these things. A wholesome tongue is a what? Tree of life. That word wholesome in the, in the Greek or Hebrew, I should say, is marpe, and it means a whole, healed, or healthy tongue. What do you think he gave on the day of Pentecost? Woo! But perverseness in it, in the tongue. Perverseness in the tongue breaks or cuts you off from the life in the spirit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. That's why on the day of the Pentecost, the Holy Spirit rushed in with the language to try to get your tongue because he knew death and life were in that power. God spoke. You go back to creation in Genesis chapter 1. God spoke. Your words direct your faith. We believe, therefore we speak, 2 Corinthians 4.13. And I'm trying to quit. I'm circling the airport looking for a landing. Are we clear on my three? We're coming in. You remember that show, Airplane? That always cracks me up. Remember that? Had one big extension cord for the runway lights. And he come up there, and all the lights went, just kidding. Stuck it back in. You're Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. <laughs> no, I'm Roger. No, I'm kidding. A wholesome tongue is a tree. A healed tongue is a tree of life. He that overcomes shall partake of the tree of life. But perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. When you understand what Christ has done, and, when, and you're overcoming based on what the new covenant has, has, has made available, you overcome because now you're partaking of a healed tongue. You're declaring what the word says. You're declaring these things, and you're not declaring, well, woe is me. And you're not looking at just what you see. You're looking at what God's word says. Open, I pray this for all of you. Open their eyes, Lord, that they, would, that they could see that they that are with us are more than they, anybody that's in the world because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Amen? Amen. Are you blessed? Yes. Amen. Look how early it is. Glory to God. Are you blessed, Tiana? You got something to say? Well, come on up here. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> that was a joke. Sometimes when people do this, I say, I'll just... <laughs> so, amen. If there's anybody here and you've never been born again, I mean, I mean I'm gonna, you got to believe this in your heart. Just because you repeat after me doesn't mean anything will happen. But if you just say yes to Jesus, and you say, I'm, I'm going to say yes to Jesus, and you believe in your heart, it'll occur. Amen? The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Say, Dear Jesus, I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. I believe in my heart that you died for my sins, and that God raised you on the third day. I receive you now as my Lord and Savior, and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Is there anybody here you got any pain in your body? I know Mark's sitting over there like this, so he's, he's probably going to give somebody some pain. We want to pray for you. Anybody? Want to pray for you? Anybody? 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 Praise God. Alan, I just want to... Man, I love you, dude. <laughs> I haven't even known you for that long, but I just know God has got his hand all over you. And God wants to do something so big in your life, and all the years that you felt like were wasted, God wants to, all that's going to be restored. I mean, God's got such a, such a handle on your life. He loves you so much. Amen. Hallelujah. Don't you love Alan? His wife's in California. I said, man, that, she can come back. That's not that far. <laughs> okay, I'm teasing you. Amen. We need to expect. That's another thing I didn't get in, into today. But we need to expect our faith to function. Amen. Amen. And we're, we're gonna, we'll probably get into that. I'm telling you, Scripture says that. So, you know, how people say, well, don't get your hopes up. Don't get your hopes up. Keep your hopes low, right? So that way you won't get disappointed. I understand that in the natural, and I've been like that myself. We all have. But I'm telling you, God wants your hopes sky high. Because now faith, then I like that, now faith, gives substance or assurance to what you're hoping for. So if my hope's down here, faith don't have a whole lot to work with. Amen? But when you get your hopes up like this, then faith can come in and bless you with exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you ask or think. But it's according to something. It's according to the power 
that you're allowing to work in you. Yes, Pam. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I want to I do that now too. I want all of us to say, let's just speak to the rest of this day and to this week. Amen. We decree good things in Jesus' name for this week. All the negative things that the enemy would try to bring against us, we come against that in the name of Jesus. Now, now th- let, me, let me say something here. That doesn't mean that you're not going to have things. Jesus said in the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. But you overcome. And even in every situation that you go through, you overcome. And we decree blessings and favor and all those things that Jesus has made available to manifest this week in our life. And everyone that agrees with that said, Amen. 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 You're blessed. Love you all.